three talks, we've looked at uh, everything from an Islamic point of view, and we've seen both the good things and the bad things about Islam, and I've also shared my conviction that Islam will fill the spiritual vacuum in this country, which is a very serious thing to say, I know. But now we're going to ask about the Christian response, because I asked the Lord, how can we be ready? In what way are we weak? Where do you see us needing strengthening? And again, I got a very clear revelation. Of course, from what I've said, there are many questions already maybe in your mind. Will we suffer? I think the answer is clearly yes. Christians will suffer. But isn't that our... Why should it be thought strange if Christians suffer? The church, when it suffers, becomes strong. Jesus called us to suffer. He said, in the world you'll have big trouble. They hated me, they'll hate you. Paul says, whoever would live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So we shouldn't be surprised if we have that privilege and honor. The New Testament Christians rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer. And to share Christ's sufferings is to know you will share the glory that followed them. There is another question, will we survive? The church having died out in North Africa, would that happen here? Will we survive? And yet that should not be our prime concern because Jesus said whoever would save his life will lose it. The real concern of the church should be that we are the kind of people not who suffer or survive but who save. That the church will go on doing its duty and its privilege to save the lost and be strong enough in that situation to have something better to offer than even Islam cannot offer. And so I said, Lord, what are the areas in the church life, what are the aspects of church life that you want us to concentrate on? And he gave me three <coughs> words immediately. They are alliterative. Now I know that could persuade you they come from me because I'm given to alliteration. But it's the province of fools, poets and Plymouth Brethren, I'm told. <laughs> but alliteration makes a thing easily to be remembered. And I believe the Lord gave me those three words immediately and altogether so that people would remember the fundamental things that he is concerned about in his church. They all begin with the letter R. They are not reading, writing and arithmetic, <laughs> but they are something else. And the first word that he gave me was reality. Our gospel is a gospel of reality. And that's the same thing as saying it's a gospel of truth. What lies behind this confrontation is a battle for truth, a battle for the mind. And there are many synonyms for truth in the dictionary. Here are some of them. Facts, reality, authenticity, actuality, accuracy, exactness. And in both the Hebrew and the Greek language, the word true and the word real are the same word. What is true is what is real. What is real is what is true. And you can substitute those two words in the scripture. It is reality that sets you free. It's the real truth about God and the real truth about you and the universe that sets you free. Now, in relativism, which is that ism I mentioned earlier, the greatest enemy of our faith, I believe, in this country, truth is not real. Truth is not objective. It's not out there. It's only in here. It's what is true for me. And what is true for me may not be true for you. But real truth is true for everybody, whether they believe it or not. Real truth is fact, not faith. Now I was warned by a prominent Christian in the Christian media world how I should talk to you today. And he said, don't say Jesus is the Son of God. He said, say Christians believe he is the Son of God. That is the very thing I'm fighting against. Because Christians believe the Son of God, everybody knows that. 
That's a fact that they believe that. The real question is, is what they believe a fact? And if it is, then it's true for the Muslim and for everybody else in the world. I'm not here to tell you what Christians believe. I'm here to tell you what I believe are facts on which our faith is based. Our faith is not based on feelings <coughs> or fancies. It's based on objective fact that would be true whether I believed it or not and are true for the entire world, whether they accept it or not. Objective truth that exists out there regardless of anyone's faith or disbelief. And the basis of our gospel is not faith. Unfortunately, recently, a lot of Christians have been putting their faith in faith, if you know what I mean. There's a faith movement that bases the gospel on faith, but it's not based on faith, it's based on fact. And that fact cannot be changed and never will change. Even God himself, almighty God, cannot change what has happened after it's happened. He cannot change the past. God himself cannot change the fact that Jesus died on the cross. No one can change it. It is a fact for everybody else as well as us. It's objective truth. Now I had a very interesting experience in Guildford not long ago in the boys' grammar school where my son had been a pupil. 850 boys of all ages, 30 staff, and they have an outside speaker for a weekly assembly. And they'd had a mullah come and give them a series of talks about Islam, and the whole school was buzzing with Islam. And I had a, an appeal, a heartfelt appeal, from one of the staff, please would you come and say something to counter this interest, which is one-sided. But it didn't come from the head of the religious department because he's a declared atheist. <laughs> but it did come from the music and French teacher, a lovely Christian who was just so concerned for his boys. And he said, if I can get you accepted, would you come? And I just felt his appeal. And because I was thinking about all this, I thought I must do something. And, but he said, you can only have 15 minutes. Now you can guess how I re react to that. Um, it takes me weeks to prepare a talk of 15 minutes. I can do a talk of hours in no time, but 15 minutes. Anyway, I really prepared and asked the Holy Spirit to take over. Stood up in front of 850 boys. And I just said, all the religions of the world could be wrong but only one of them can be right. And boy, did they listen from then on. <laughs> and bless them, the Holy Spirit so took over at the end, they gave me a standing ovation. Headmaster was astonished. But the uh, dear teacher who got me to go rang me up last week, week before, six months later. He said, there's no talk of Islam anymore. And he said, all the wobbly Christians are now firm. <laughs> And he said, the head of religion has lost all his scorn for Christianity. Hallelujah for that. But I went on to say this, they could be all wrong and therefore you've got to be an atheist or an agnostic. But there are so radical differences between them that only one can be right. Because the real question is not do you believe in God? The real question is what kind of a God do you believe in? What is God really like? Which of the many gods in the world that are worshipped is real and which is not real? That's why this first word is reality. Now when you ask the question, what kind of a God do you believe in? You've got to subdivide that into other questions. One of which is, do you believe in a God who is a person or a thing? A he or she or an it? A force or someone or something? And of course the Buddhist would give one answer to that and the Jew would give another. Many would feel God is simply a force for good in each of us. May the force be with you. 
That's not the God of Christianity. Once you've decided God is a person and not a thing, you have to ask another question. How many persons are there called God? And again, you get different answers. The Hindu says 30 million. The Muslim says one. The Christian doesn't say either of those, he says three. And that immediately means we are not worshipping the same God. One of the most common questions I get, and it's answered in an entirely different way in a Christian magazine you'll see downstairs. It says we are worshipping the same God. We are not. A university professor said to me three days ago, when I talk to my Muslim colleagues, I don't recognize the God they talk about. It's just someone quite different from the God I know. I've told you already, he has a different name. His name is not Allah. That's never mentioned once in the Bible. One of the 99 names in the sense of God, but it's not in our Bible. He has a different nature, not just a different name. And this is the key. I want you to realize that the Trinity is Christianity's greatest asset. Many people think it's our greatest embarrassment because we're presenting people with a mystery. Many vicars don't like preaching on Trinity Sunday. And there was a time when I used to get invited to preach on Trinity Sunday, <laughs> the good time to have a visiting preacher and let him handle the problems. But that is our greatest asset. Let me tell you why. If God is only one person, as the Muslims believe, he cannot be love. There is only one religion in the world that can say God is love. And the reason why the word love never occurs in the Quran is very simple. Because Allah is not love and cannot be, for the very simple reason that love is a relationship. No person on their own can be love. Have you got that? Mm -hmm. Terribly important. important. You cannot say God is love. You could say loves people, but who did he love before there were any people? The answer is he is, was, and always will be love because the Father always loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father. Now that may sound naive, but can you imagine not being able to say God is love? We take it for granted as Christians, but only a Christian can say it. The Jew doesn't say it, it's not in the Old Testament, and none of the other religions can say that, and don't. Now what do we mean by three persons? We mean, to use a rather complicated phrase, three centers of consciousness. I am a center of consciousness, my wife is a center of consciousness, therefore I am conscious that I am not my wife, and she is conscious she is not me. And therefore my center of consciousness can relate to her center by talking to her and relating. Do you follow that? If father and son were one person, how could the son pray to the father? Or the father talk to the son? There would only be one center of consciousness. And yet these three centers of consciousness are so close and share so much that we can hardly think of them separately. And we always talk about God as him and not them. It's a mystery, but then, not surprisingly, God is like nobody else. He is unique. We would expect him to be different. He's God, we're man. The nearest we can get to is when a couple marry and become one flesh, and people don't talk about them as separate, they talk about the Porsons, and they called our house the Porsonage. And, uh, <laughs> And that's only a pale reflection of how close Father, Son, and Spirit are. But they are still three persons, and he is love. 
Furthermore, there's another word that doesn't occur in all the 99 names of Allah, and that's the word Father. You won't find that in the Quran either. A converted Muslim lady wrote a famous book called I Dared to Call Him Father. Now, how would you like a Christianity in which there is no loving father anymore? I leave you to realize how much you lose if you don't believe in the Trinity. But God has revealed himself as a Trinity and that makes our God different from everybody else's. Trinity is blasphemy to the Muslim. But even Christians are not always aware of just how much the Trinity is crucial to our faith. It is the biggest difference between us and Islam and it will come out again and again in the next three talks. Yes, Islam says he is the creator from whom we come and the judge to whom we go. But in between he is our loving father. The Quran says specifically, directly, in reaction to Christian faith, God has no son. Therefore he's not a father. Those words, God has no son, are inscribed around the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, if you ever go. And there in the very city where the Son of God was crucified and raised, God has no son. Therefore, you cannot call him a father. He is not a father, never will be. He is God. He is Allah. Well, now this is a huge difference, not just in kind, but in degree. Quite simply, Allah and the Father of Jesus are not the same God. They cannot both be real. They cannot both exist. The Bible God, who is the Yahweh of Israel, the name given to him 9,000 times, says there is no one beside me. No one. All other gods in the Bible are unreal. All idols are unreal, except that the Bible does say behind every false god, behind every idol, is a demonic deceiver. Now there are two things that Christians must be absolutely sure of if we're ready for what is coming to this country. One is, they are not the same god. Muslims don't say that, it's Christians who are saying it. And they are falling right into the trap. And the second is that one of these gods is not real. The Bible talks about the only true God. That's a lovely New Testament phrase, the only true, which as I've told you means the only real one. And however sincere others praying to other gods are, there is only one true one. Now both the Quran and the Bible are theological books in that they talk about God. But there is one huge difference between the Bible and the Quran, which to me was a crucial factor. I went to Cambridge and I studied theology from some fine tutors, and at least they taught me to think clearly for myself, which I'm grateful to them, but they taught me to read the Bible with a pair of scissors, to cut it up and cut bits out, and after two years of that, I could not preach. I had nothing to preach. I didn't know which part of the Bible I could trust and rely on. And uh, I went through a crisis, but on my 21st birthday, I went out into the Cambridge bookshop and I bought myself a present. A book by a, a Swiss theologian that I'd never met, I'm looking forward to meeting him in glory, called Christ and Time. And that book brought me right back to faith in the whole Bible. Any of you read Oscar Kuhlman's Christ and Time? And all it did for me was tell me that time is real to God. 
The Greek God and so many other gods are timeless. They're outside time. They're in some vague area called eternity. I've heard Christ Christians Preachers say that God is timeless and that when we go to heaven we'll go outside of time. But in my Bible, God is the God who was and is and is to come. He's the God who does things and cannot change the past once it's happened. Like us, he can change the future but not the past. That's fixed for God as well as us. But above all, I realize that time is the key to the whole story of the Bible. It is a history book. The difference from other history books is it starts earlier and it finishes later. It starts with the beginning of the universe, it finishes with the end and gives you the whole history of our universe. But it is a history, but it says history is his story. And it is the story of what God has done within history, in our world of time and space. And that's what is meant by the term the living God. You've heard about God is dead movement, have you? It was a philosopher called Nietzsche, who was the philosopher behind Hitler's thinking, who said God is dead. He did not mean God has gone out of existence, that he no longer exists. Many people just picked the phrase up and thought that's what it meant. He didn't mean that at all. And there was a, a poster up in a German university and on it it said, God is dead, signed Nietzsche. And underneath a wagon written, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. <laughs> Which I thought was quite a, a neat reply. But when he said God is dead, he didn't mean God was not around anymore. He meant he's gone somewhere else. He's no longer speaking and doing things within our world. And that, of course, is true for us. When someone dies, they are no longer able to communicate or able to act in our world. They are in another world. Our daughter died a few years ago. I believe she's very alive, but not to us. We can't talk. She can't do things. But she's not dead. <coughs> she's not ceased to exist. You understand what I'm saying? Now, God is not dead, but he is in the Bible the living God. That means he's in our world. He's saying things and doing things here, within time and space. Now, no other religion that I know uses the phrase the living God, except Jews and Christians who know what he's said and what he's done. That means that, to use some technical theological terms, God is imminent as well as transcendent. Emmanuel means God with us. Now, the Muslim God is a transcendent God. He's the God above us, full stop. He's a way out there somewhere. The Trinity means that God the Father is above us, our Father who art in heaven, that God the Son is beside us, and God the Holy Spirit is within us. There's nothing like that in any other religion. The Trinity, again, is the key that unlocks our faith. And if Christians are shaky on the Trinity, we're going to get nowhere. The word itself, Trinity, doesn't occur in Scripture. I know that. But it stands for what is in Scripture. And therefore, whether I use the actual word or not, I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because my Bible is about what each of them did in our world. God the Father did things, and then God the Son came into our world, and he did things. And then he left, and he sent the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit has done things ever since and is still doing them. The living God, not only above, but wide and within. Oh, we must be proud of what we've got. <laughs> be confident in it. Now, there are two features in the Bible to consider. Miracles and prophecies. The miracles are what God <coughs> has done and the prophecies of what God has said. It is the words and deeds of God within history 
that we need to be sure of if we're going to face other religions. A miracle is a physical event with a spiritual cause. It is a natural event with a supernatural cause. Supremely, the events surrounding the exodus from Egypt and the events surrounding our Lord's life, death, and resurrection are crucial. Here we have events which God did independently of human beings. He did them by himself, if you like. And so they can't be explained by human activity. God divides the Red Sea. Moses did and Moses couldn't. God raised Jesus from the dead. Nobody else could have done that. And if we lose faith in the miracles recorded in the Bible, we're going to get into trouble. But I'll show you in a moment what is happening to belief in miracles in the Christian church. Prophecies. The miracles show the God who acts. Prophecies show the God who speaks. The miracles show that God is in total control of na nature and nations. He can handle both. Almighty God can change the weather and can bring an empire down to dust. That's the God we worship. But what about the prophecies? God's words are always related to his deeds. And this is how. Before he's going to do something, he tells us what he's going to do. And after he's done it, he tells us what he's done and why he did it and how it impacts our life. And so prophecies are always related to what God has done. The major prophets of the Old Testament are constantly looking back to the Exodus and saying, that's what he did, now this is why he did it. He wanted a covenant people who would live right. Now, this is where we're on very strong ground. In your Bible, 23% of the verses, that's nearly one in four, have a prediction in them. This book is about the future, beginning to end. And here are some statistics now. You can blind people with statistics, and it was an ancestor of mine, Sir John Sinclair, who coined the word statistic. And he must have had his own teeth in when he did it, because statistics is a horrible word to say if you haven't got your own teeth. But there it was. He was a farmer in Scotland, and he invented the word to count sheep and count crop results and so on. But I know you can blind people with statistics, but here are some that are staggering, that should open your eyes. In the Bible, altogether, there are 735 predictions about the future. Some of them mentioned once, one of them mentioned 300 times, but 735 separate predictions. And of those, 596 have come literally true. That is over 80%. Four out of five predictions have already happened and can be historically demonstrated to have happened. Now, it doesn't take me a lot of faith to believe the other 20% are also going to happen. What a record! That alone would prove to me that we've got the words of God in this book. Because only God could have predicted some of those things. Stat statisticians, there's the word again, have shown that some of those predictions, the chances of them coming true, were 10 to the power of 39. Now, only those with mathematical minds will understand what an incredible odds against that figure is. But there we are. The most outstanding one in my mind was when he said Tyre, the city, would be thrown into the sea. Every brick, stone, and bit of timber thrown into the sea. That has never happened to any city in the whole of history except one. Guess which? Tyre. And Alexander the Great did that to Tyre actually to build a causeway out to the island half a mile off the shore where the citizens of Tyre had got into boats and fled and he had no boats. So he just said, throw the city in the sea 
and build a causeway and we'll go out and defeat them. And no other city has ever been thrown in the sea, never. Well, that's just one of 735. You see, because this is a book of history, then it can be examined and there is external evidence for it. And with the normal rules of historical evidence or the normal rules of legal evidence, the resurrection is proved to have happened enough to convince any jury in the world. A combination of eyewitness testimony and circumstantial evidence which would be enough for any jury to reach a decision beyond reasonable doubt, this happened. But people who don't want to believe, all the evidence in the world won't convince them. I've come to the conclusion faith is a matter of choice. <laughs> people choose to believe the evidence or they choose not to believe the evidence, but there it is. This book is not a book of philosophy. It's a book of history. It's a book of fact. Whether people believe it or not, it happened. And all we have done is believe the facts and build our faith on it. Now from these miracles and prophecies we know not only what God is really like, but that he is real. That there is a real God and we know what he's like. And we know he's a trinity because all three persons have been in our world and said and done things in our world. The Trinity is the living God. And so that's why we believe it. It's also a Jewish book through and through because this living God chose to do these things and to say these things for and through the Jewish people. And that was his choice. He chose them to share the knowledge with the whole world. Take a book like John's Gospel. John's sole purpose was that of every historian. Every historian chooses, selects the facts he wants to include, which he thinks gives significance to the ongoing events. If a historian wrote down everything a man did or everything a nation did, you couldn't get a book big enough. So every historian selects the most appropriate things, the most significant things. John says at the end of his gospel, if I wrote down everything Jesus said and did, <laughs> the whole world couldn't contain the books. But I have written these, these are written, that you may go on believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And he selects seven miracles Seven, three would be enough to prove a thing. Seven miracles which are more sensational than anything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, which only a God could have done. Resurrection of Lazarus when he was stinking, changing water into wine. Seven miracles which are so sensational that no man could ever have done them. And seven witnesses who all were convinced that he was the Son of God, who knew him personally, and seven words of Jesus, which only God has a right to say, I am the Good Shepherd, the Bread of Life, the Way, the Truth, and the Life. Only God has the right to talk like that. And so here is the historian John, and he selects seven miracles, seven witnesses, seven words, which should leave no one in any doubt that Jesus was not just a great man or a great teacher or a martyr for his principles, but he was God the Son. But what's happening in the church? Christian confidence in the Bible is being gradually eroded from within the church. Who needs enemies outside the church when people are attacking the Bible inside the church? As a reliable record of God's deeds and words, it has been steadily undermined. The great new relativist thinking about the Bible is that it's not a book of events, it's a book of values. And therefore it's a book of myth. Now a myth is a story, a fiction, that has 
a moral in it. Aesop's fables were classic. Jesus' parables were also that. But the development that has taken place is that the things recorded in the Bible didn't actually happen, but we can learn values from the story. It started with Adam and Eve right at the beginning. They didn't live, it didn't happen, but oh, we can learn a lot about ourselves from the story of Adam and Eve. It moved on to Noah. Noah's flood didn't happen, but it's a story that has a, a lesson for us all in it. It moved on from there to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then to Moses. Above all, to Jonah. Didn't really happen. Jonah wasn't a real person. It's a missionary tract. I was told that. And yet the Bible tells us that Jonah lived in the village next to Nazareth. We have the name of his dad, Amittai. And it presents it to us as a fact. Nineveh was a real place. Why shouldn't it have happened? But gradually the Old Testament was dissolved into stories with a meaning. And I'm afraid that's how they're often taught, even in Sunday school. And then it crept into the New Testament. Jesus was born of a virgin. That's a beautiful story to tell us that he was different from other people. He wasn't raised physically from the grave. That's now widespread. And the one that is most doubted today by preachers and theologians is that he ascended into heaven. The Bishop of Edinburgh, primate of Scotland, was being interviewed on the radio, and I was listening, and the interviewer said, do you believe Jesus will come back to earth? And he said, of course not. And the interviewer said, why not? He said, because he never left. But his whole idea of the ascension was spiritualized. Jesus didn't go up into heaven. He stayed with us in a different way. Now, all this is going on, and gradually, confidence in the Bible as a record of God's deeds and words has been steadily eroded. And the way to do that is to interpret the Bible allegorically, spiritually and find spiritual meaning so that the raising of Lazarus according to one of the most widely used commentators by Christian clergy by William Barclay is not an, an event that happened it's to t tell us that Jesus can give us new life that's the meaning of the story not that a stinking corpse was healed and restored but that it's to tell us Jesus can give you new life or to take Jesus said, if you had faith that big, you could say to a mountain, jump in the sea, and there we go. And I've heard sermons on the mountains of doubt, the mountains of fear. This is allegorizing, this is spiritualizing. When Jesus said mountain there, he meant mountain. And I could take you to Japan, where some orphan children prayed and asked Jesus to throw a mountain in the sea, and that mountain is in the sea now. And I've got a photograph of it. But how do you feel about that? Oh, David's really falling for things now. Our relativist age has problem with miracle. And so those of us who take the Bible serious, now listen, let me distinguish. I don't take all the Bible literally. If I did, there would only be animals in heaven. And I went to heaven for people. Because it says Jesus will separate the sheep and the goats. <laughs> and now look, it is obvious when Jesus in his parables or sayings is speaking metaphorically and spiritually. But when the Bible presents us with something as fact, I take that literally. Uh, the book of Revelation is a mixture of things to be taken symbolically and literally. Nobody takes it all literally, nobody takes it all symbolically. And you've got to discern when it's intended to be literal. Is it going to be a literal dragon? Or is that a symbol of the devil? Well, common sense is one of the best aids to Bible study. But what happens? I must read you what the Bishop of Edinburgh that I've already mentioned said about me. 
when I wrote the book Leadership is Male. He said, in searching the scriptures, David Pawson can only find male leadership as the model for relationship between the sexes. And he is absolutely right. That's what the Bible says, along with a lot of other stuff we have long since discarded. Mr. Pawson's difficulty is tragic. I'm reading what he says. He is a good and kindly man and a fine Christian leader, but he is absolutely hung up on a fundamentalist method of scriptural interpretation. It makes him consistent, or as consistent as scripture, but he believes in doing what he thinks the Bible tells him to do. I'm keeping that for my epitaph. <laughs> Listen, I believe, I believe that unless Christians are fundamentalist in the best sense of that word, they're going to go under facing other religions. If we do not take the Bible literally where it is intended to be taken literally, if we dismiss events, the records of what God has done and said as myth or mystery, we have nothing to stand on. And therefore, my first big plea in this talk is that Christians will need to recover confidence in the Bible. If they don't, they'll be shot down. I don't mind being called a fundamentalist. But it's interesting, I quote, again, a Muslim leader, all Muslims are fundamentalists. We have to be fundamentalists because it is obligatory that we believe in the fundamentals of Islam. Thus it is irrelevant to call a Muslim a fundamentalist. But in Christian circles, that term has become an epithet of contempt. Now I believe one of the major things that God is saying is, do you believe my word? Above all, we shall need to be consent convinced that the Bible deals with absolute truth, not relative, and absolute ethics, not relative. Some things are true and some things are false. Some things are right and some things are wrong. The Bible is a black and white book. You're in darkness or light. You're on the road that is the road of death or the road of life. You're either into truth or lies. You can tell when someone believes in absolute truth because they are prepared to say that the opposite is absolutely untrue. And we need to say what is false as well as what is true and what is wrong as well as what is right if we're going to communicate God's truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. And finally, above all, we must be convinced as Christians that Jesus is the only way of salvation. That there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. And that applies, that's truth for everybody, not just Christians. And if we're not sure of that, we will have no burden for the Muslim, or for that matter, for anybody else in the world. We'll say, well, they can find God their way, and we've found God our way, and let's agree to differ and live together in peace and harmony. It is not arrogance to talk this way. I always say to people, I don't say I have the truth. What I do say is, the truth has me. And that's a different thing. But to claim that you found the truth in a relativist age you will then discover that tolerance isn't the most widespread virtue of all. There is an intolerance against those who claim to have discovered the truth that is bigotry and dismissed. And I'm going to add this. We may well have to die for the truth. Christians are doing so already, one every two minutes. But I don't think many Christians in this country are convinced enough about the truth to be willing to die for it, rather than deny it. But that's what we're going to be called to do. Before that, of course, we need to be determined to live the truth. 
but your convictions are not strong enough if you're not prepared to die for them. The man I most identify with in the Bible is Jeremiah. <laughs> I really identify with him. I'm so looking forward to meeting him. But he had to stand for the truth against false prophets among his own people. But the man in Pilgrim's Progress, now Pilgrim's Progress is a myth. It's a story full of messages, but it's made up, it's fiction. But it's still got a lot of good messages in it. It's quite different from the Bible. But the man I'm most identified with is a man, Mr. Valiant for Truth. Do you know that man? Mr. Valiant for Truth. And he paid for it with his life. Would you be willing to die for your convictions? We may be called on that. But whether we are able to go through with that will depend on a second thing, which is the subject of my next talk. Another word beginning with R. So come back and hear what that word is.